Greetings, the Astro 30 here yet again and welcome back to AEL. Now, if you're new to this channel, please consider going down below and subscribing if you haven't done so already. Cheers. Today's video is more of a response video to a video that Cool Dude Clem, and his channel's linked in the description, plus the video I'm talking about, on a headphone amplifier that he came up with. Now, the basic premise behind this is a Darlington voltage follower, so whatever uh, voltage comes in, in an ideal world, is the same voltage that comes out. The only difference is, it delivers more current to the output. So it doesn't give you any voltage gain, but it gives you current gain. There's just one caveat to this type of approach. It depends on the impedance of the headphones you're driving. He's got it to 32 ohms, which is pretty much a standard impedance for the cheaper headphones, but some of the more expensive headphones are around about the more like the 120 ohm impedance range. And even some of the cheaper ones range between 32 and 64. So I believe the pair of headphones I've got, which are Stadium HP Studio headphones, are 64 ohm impedance. He didn't actually do any tests on an oscilloscope with some various different loads to see what the difference is in input voltage versus output voltage. So, having said that, I would think you'd want to include maybe a small class A uh, buffer stage with a gain of two before this circuit, just to, you know, account for, you know, variances in different loads here with the input adjustment potentiometer, uh, just to, you know, compensate, basically. Uh, also, it also depends on the input source. Now, if the input source, like a preamp, doesn't have enough voltage gain coming out in the first place, well, you're going to get very low volume at the headphones. But this basic Darlington driver is biased at the halfway voltage point of plus 12 volts, so we have 6 volts roughly here. And we'd expect to see, with including the diode drops of the transistors here, about 5 volts at the emitter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build this up on a bit of breadboard that I've got spare. Um, he used different transistors. I don't have those transistors but for this type of circuit it doesn't really matter. We just need a decent transistor here, medium power, in order to drive the 32, 64 and 120 ohm load respectively. So BD139 will do. And I'll put it into various different load resistances and we'll measure it on our scope. So let me get to quickly fleshing this out on a breadboard. And there we go there. A short time later I've got the circuit built up on a breadboard. I may or may not need a heat sink for that BD139, depending on the load we're driving. But we're not driving 8 ohms or anything like that, so I don't see that that's going to get all that exceedingly hot. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to test this unloaded. So I'm going to put a 2 volt RMS input signal here and measure what the result unloaded is on the output. So let me set up my test equipment and we'll uh, do some tests. Right, I've got the circuit set up ready for testing now. I've got two probes, one measuring the input, one measuring the output. The circuit is turned on, and the upper trace, the yellow one, is measuring the output, and the blue one is measuring the input. The input is set to roughly 2 volt RMS, and surprisingly, the output, unloaded, is roughly the same. 1.99 volt RMS. Which is, okay, that's, that's good. So we know that it's working as a voltage follower, and just touching the BD139. It's not getting hot. Well, it's not loaded, so it shouldn't be getting hot. So now what I need to do is I need to load it with 32 ohms, or thereabouts, if I can find a suitable enough resistance to make 32 ohms, and then test again. Well, I found a 27 ohm in my stash. I don't have a 33 ohm, which would have been nice, but uh, oh well, it'll do for testing. At least I don't think I have a 33 ohm. I've got a 22 ohm and a 0.33 ohm, which is no good. So I'll use this as a load first. Good night. 
Cool. Okay, so I'll connect the resistor up to the output. Yes, the scope's still measuring directly at the output. I'm using a 470 microfarad output capacitor too, by the way. I think that's more than adequate for headphones. So now I'll connect that to the ground point. So I'll turn the supply back on. Whoa. Well, it can barely drive it. Um, yeah, it seems to be clipping a little bit early. Okay, so with... I have no idea what the input voltage is because I have to go around the camera. Alright, so with about 284 millivolt in, we're getting 219 millivolt out, which is good enough for driving headphones at 32 ohms, I suppose. However, I'm not liking uh, the lower peak looking a little bit bit you know how you're doing sagging so we've lost a bit of voltage going and that transistor is still not getting hot and according to my power supply we're not drawing much current either if anything I can't really see with this supply because the meters are not accurate the load itself is cold so um hmm that sort of result is to be expected uh, but obviously we can't drive the headphones with a 2 volt RMS input signal because, well, it just clips badly, asymmetrically. So, okay, the next thing I'm going to do is, because I don't have 64, I'm going to put two 120 ohm 2 watt resistors, I believe I've got 2 watt resistors, in parallel with each other to make 64, well, in this case, 60, and uh, test the output voltage again. I've got two 120 ohm resistors in parallel with each other to make an effective resistance of 60 ohms. Yes, this is not an exact science here, but it'll do for testing purposes. So the scope's not triggering because, well, there's nothing on the yellow tray, so I'll turn the circuit back on without touching the gain on the oscillator. And well, not much of a difference at 60 ohms. We're getting 255 millivolts out into the load. So, turning the power supply back off, I'm going to um, disconnect one of the 120 uh, ohms out of parallel with the other. And now we're going to go straight to 120 ohm, which is, you know, your average expensive pair of headphones. Not all headphones are the same. And that is actually a significant difference. We're getting 267 millivolts at 120 ohm load, which is slightly higher than the 60 ohm load. Um, hmm, well, so I guess for all intents and purposes, barely warm, this little circuit does actually function and probably doesn't need the class A buffer at the, at the front because 267 millivolts at the headphone drivers into your ears is pretty loud and significantly loud and any higher than that can lead to permanent hearing loss if not complete hearing damage so yeah that's going to be pretty loud into the headphones. So the idea of this video was not to reinvent his design or change it, it was to test it. And I've tested it and, well, I'm happy with the results. So I think I might just leave this well alone. Um, I could add a Class A buffer at the start, but I don't really see the point. Because the only point I would see to that is if the voltage at the input was lower. But I don't see anything except maybe a phone, headphone output, like uh, an Android phone, being less than the 200 and 
whatever it is of millivolts going in. And actually, it does go a lot higher at 120 ohms than it did at the 27, which would make sense. That's fine. Why? Because the impedance is higher and this transistor has a much easier time driving a high impedance load than it does a lower impedance load. So the lower the impedance gets, the harder and harder it is to drive it. But however you would think the lower the impedance, the more output power you get. Well, it depends on the design of the circuit. In this case, it's, it's having an easier time driving a higher impedance load than it is driving a low impedance load. And the lower the impedance, obviously, the lower and lower we get with voltage gain into the load. There obviously is a limit. But as I was saying uh, at the start, it depends on the output of the source. If the source is like, you know, 103 millivolts, well, we're only getting 95 millivolts at the output, so we're actually getting a loss. So that would be the only reason I would see you'd want to add a Class A amplifier buffer with a gain of 2 just to increase that. But we've also got to think of our input voltage maximum. So if we go a lot further, well we're only at 922 uh, input roughly, actually more like 1 volt RMS, and with asymmetrical clipping we're only getting 890 out roughly. It can go quite significantly high before it actually tries to clip on the positive going sig signal as well. So, yeah, all in all, I think this circuit works just fine as it is without any modification. So, okay, I'm happy. I've tested it. Oh, my, my curiosity is satisfied. As I say, I've linked the original video and Cool Do Clem's channel in the description, so you can go check him out. He has a lot of um, interesting videos to do with electronics. He's got some other videos which you may not find all that interesting or entertaining, but that's, you know, you can't please everyone. Um, especially videos on Tesla coils. He, he has quite a fair few videos on Tesla coil drivers and high voltage experiments with Tesla coils, which I find quite interesting. Um, so yeah, go check him out. Anyway, I'm the Astro 30. If you enjoyed this video, please go down below, like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And as always, this is the Astro 30 saying, see ya, have a great day. Oh, my finger looks big. Well, my thumb, not my finger. And just one final tip before I go. When storing your oscilloscope probes, always flip them back into the times 10 mode because if you're like me and in the habit of not checking shit before connecting stuff up, you can run the risk of damaging your test equipment. So I always like to store my oscilloscope probes at the times 10 mark. If it was a 100 times probe, it'd be the 100. Just in case. Anyway, that's my tip for the day. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.